Hello and welcome to the Ansa Podcast, Military Path Bats Unveiled. I'm your host, Captain Manuel Calo. Today, we're exploring the personal and professional journeys of two distinguished guests from the U.S. Marine Corps, Chief Warrant Officer 2, Madeline Almodovar Sanabria, and First Lieutenant Rafael Almodovar Sanabria, both stationed in Okinawa, Japan. Before we dive in, please note that the, this podcast is not affiliated with the U.S. government of the Department of De- or the Department of Defense and reflects only our guests' personal views and experiences. Make sure you, to follow us on the YouTube and, f- and Facebook at Answer Mail and subscribe to the Answer Podcast on YouTube and Spotify for more engaging conversations. So without further ado, I want to present the guests for tonight, uh, Lieutenant Almodovar and uh, uh, Warren Officer Almodovar. How's, uh, how are you guys doing tonight? Doing good, man. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, so we had a conversation prior to the podcast. Uh, we, we're going to do this in a couple of phases. So let's begin, like, who is uh, First Lieutenant Rafael Almodovar and Chief Warren Officer 2, uh, Madeline Almodovar, so we can have a background history from, for the audience that's listening in this podcast. So, <laughs> yeah, you can go ahead, Madeline. Let's 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 have you first. So, who you are, where you came from, like, what was your background, and then uh, okay. what was your uh, motivation to join the Marines? Yeah. So, my name is Madeline. Um, I I didn't have uh, a goal basically when I was in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, it was coming to the decision point where you needed to start applying for colleges, um, and I just I knew I didn't have a career choice in mind. So I. The recruiter started to come to the school. I had friends whose mm-hmm. older siblings started joining. Um, it really got me thinking, like, maybe the military is a decision that, like, a, an option for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to one PT at my local Marine Corps recruiting office, and it was just, it, I felt that sense of, like, this is something that I want to do. Um, I actually graduated early from, from high school, okay. and my parents signed me off, and I left for boot camp at 17. Um, I didn't have a contract in mind, so I went into the communications field. I accepted that, and I was just more excited for the journey and something to be, uh, something that would lead me to be independent and just get me started, whether I wanted to stay in or not. Um, I definitely said from the beginning, like I'm going to do, I'll, I'll do 20 years and I'll, you know, I'll retire. Gotcha. Um, but it was, it was something that gave me a lot of drive and motivation. So yeah, I, I left at 17. I graduated. On my 18th birthday, and you know oh. the rest. So, sure. so question. So question. And before we dive in with Rafael, so do you had any other uh, sister services on mine at that time, or was it just purely Marines when when you start making that that decision? I think my first introduction was Air Force. I have uh, family who okay. served in the Air Force, so that was just the first the first thought. Um, of course, I went to the recruiter. I didn't get the same vibe as I think I was looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, I talked to the Marine recruiter and just the camaraderie with PT and just everybody that was in the office, what my options were, led me to the Marine Corps. So yeah, Air Force first and then... And then Marines. Yeah. Okay. And then what about the ASVAB process and how difficult was it? It was it was difficult for you for the ASVAB and, and, and selecting your job in the Marines? How, how that how that process was for you let's see i went in and took a couple pre-tests for the asvab um i didn't score great i didn't score bad i had a few options i don't exactly remember what they were communications and um maybe administration gotcha. uh, but the communications was going to get me out the door faster okay. so it's all about it. I get any job again. Like I didn't have a specific trade in mind mm-hmm. that I wanted to. Like, I really want to go, um, you know, one way or the other. So yeah. So yeah. so basically, uh-huh. the communication the communication was the one that was getting you uh, shipped out to your to your basic uh, as quickly as possible. And then how was that basic f- uh, for Marine the Marine basis for you once you just out of you know, got shipped out, got to your basic duties, uh, to your basic. How was it, that experience for you? Uh, it was, it was a wake up call for sure. <laughs> it was different than what I expected. You know, you see in movies and you see all these videos and 
they're a little in, more intense. Um, so I was definitely prepared for something more difficult. Not that it wasn't difficult. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess it was just an experience in, in itself. Yeah. I didn't know how to prepare other than like work out and just be prepared to be tired mm -hmm. and just listen to what they're asking of you and you just have to do it. And I think that's probably the biggest difference is you're going from being, you know, being a kid to being a young adult, graduating high school okay. to now accepting, Hey, if somebody tells you to do something, you can't question it. You just, you have to do it. You and I think that's what, got me through. <laughs> yeah, that's what got me through boot camp is accepting. 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 Yeah. Okay, so let, let's go now with Rafael. So Rafael, can you speak uh, on your experiences? Like, I know you're, you're from San Germán, Puerto Rico. Can you speak about you and, and then what was your experience uh, joining the Marine Corps? Yeah, of course. Uh, for me, I did not join at 17. Um, I left for boot camp at 19 after a year in the, the late entry program. Um, I did consider other branches first. Mm -hmm. However, Uh, same uh, reaction you know I never got the same feeling that it was it was what I was looking for uh, one of my best friends uh, Joshua he joined the Marines and he shipped out uh, September immediately after we graduated high school so always worked out with him I looked up to him a lot he's like a big brother to me so looking at that from that perspective uh, he convinced me to go actually finally look into the Marine Corps. Um, we had seen the recruiters in school, you know, high school mm -hmm. uh, as seniors, hey, come talk to me, join the Marines. And gotcha. often I just blew them off and said, no, that's not for me. Mm -hmm. um, but here we are. Um, <laughs> so for me, uh, yeah, from I'm from Guanica, Puerto Rico. I, I, I was born in San Germán. Okay. I shipped out of Mayagüez, um, RSS, Mayagüez, Puerto Rico. So going to boot camp for me, given that I had almost a whole year to just prep for it, uh, was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I, saw, I saw the ones that went and didn't make it for physical mm -hmm. uh, challenges, and I didn't want to be that guy. So I kept pushing myself uh, to do better. Um, the ISTs once a month. Uh, initial strength uh, test for those that don't know what it stands for. And, uh, you know, taking leadership roles within uh, the recruiting substation to ensure that not just I was ready, but kind of, you know, worried about those that would represent Puerto Rico going to, to the basic training yeah. would actually perform as well. So uh, working with the recruiters and working with, uh, you know, the bosses and everything else. Nice. Fitting. So, so how was your selection, Rafael, for your first job, in the, your, your job selection in the morning? How you do that or how you did that or how you selected amongst all the jobs available for you? Yeah, so the reason I waited a year in the late entry program was um, I've always had a passion for aircraft maintenance and that field in aviation. So going in, signing a contract, I knew I wanted to be something in aviation. Mm -hmm. Aviation mechanic was an option. However, it was not a, a quick ship. So for me, uh, after taking the ASVAB, I qualified for a number of jobs. Um, getting me out the door was, you know, options like Comstrat, um, weather, man, something, I don't even know what it's called, um, or the open contract. Uh, however, the option for aviation maintenance uh, was there. Mm -hmm. We just had to wait because of numbers, the numbers came and everything else. Gotcha. So I think it took by surprise my recruiter when I told him I was okay with waiting. I didn't care. You know, I, it was something I knew I wanted to do and I had a passion for it. Okay. Uh, so we went nice. that route. Nice. And then um, now I'm going to pass with Madeline. So let's talk about your first assignment. So after you just completed your basic and your uh, your AIT for us, which is like your your MOS, you know, school. So you went to the actually fleet marine, your first assignment as to the fleet marine force with, uh, I'm sorry, with the third marine, uh, marine aircraft wing. Can you talk about that experiences and how was it for you once you, you reached your first assignment? Yeah, so after I went through, you know, boot camp or our version of combat training and then my MOS school, 
um, I got to the fleet and I was with an air wing. So we supported uh, basically the ACE, the, all the air wing uh, missions and operations. So my experience was uh, beyond California, we did exercises in Yuma, 29 Palms, um, and it was a different experience than what I had expected was just you know, working with radios and uh, radio equipment as we're working with aircraft and we're work working with the wings mission. So that was definitely interesting for me, not having a background in the military and not really understanding that, you know, there's more than just walking, hiking around with a radio mm -hmm. um, to supporting air missions. Nice. What about you, Rafael? Can you speak about your first uh, assignment as well? Yeah, my first assignment was uh, Marine Aviation Logistics Squadron uh, 16, also on Miramar, California. Um, I got the MOS of a uh, parachute rigger for aircraft mm -hmm. uh, under aviation life support systems. So our mission was to ensure everything that needed to work if the aircraft went down worked and that the air crew pilots or anybody on that plane or helicopter had everything they needed to survive and come make it home alive. So uh, big responsibility. Uh, once I checked into my unit, uh, it was a big uh, eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. A lot of my leadership was either coming back or going back into Afghanistan at the time. So the, the turnover rate was, was really big and uh, had a lot of uh, non-commissioned officers shaping uh, all the new uh, new joints from the unit to ensure that we were also performing at that level. Um, so it was it was very, really good experience. Nice. All right. It, it sounds interesting how your first assignments can like be an eye opener for anyone, right? Because like you're coming from... For example, from from you, Rafael, from from Puerto Rico down to now your first unit, and same with you, Madeline. Just go all the way to California, start working in your MOS, and then it can be like a very up tempo, uh, up tempo, you know, challenging. And then you have to adjust yourself to what's happening because like you're you know like very uh, new to the unit. Now, in those early stages, can any one of you can share uh, like a key moments that shape your decisions of for until today's day, for example, like, hey, this made me, you know, start thinking about me being a commission officer or so, for example. Anyone can share? Yeah, of course. Um, so I, you know, I didn't have a great experience my first enlistment. So the first four years, a lot of that, you know, was school, but getting to my first unit and it was an eye opener. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big adjustment that some people go through easier than others. Um, there's just a lot of personal, professional things that I had, I let get to my head. Um, so it was a hard adjustment, you know, working the hours that we're working, supporting the off tempo that we are. Um, and basically I, it led me to almost get out of the Marine Corps. I had terminal leave approved and I was, I was just ready to move on. Wow. Um, I had a few mentors that were, were there really asking the probing questions like mm -hmm. why, you know, what's, what's the motivation behind yeah. Um, your decision here, let me offer you some options that we can work towards. And long story short, I ended up re-enlisting. I got promoted to sergeant. I asked for Okinawa orders and that placed me in a really good position. Um, my, my motivation and drive was, was up there and I was willing to work for, you know, what I wanted. So that led me into, uh, transitioning from my basic MOS to now doing ComSec, so communication security. Okay. Still within the communications field, but uh, you know, a separate billet, and so that led me on to now here being a warrant officer. I have all these different experiences mm -hmm. with different MOSs and uh, within the communications field. So, so to shorten that up, I I really was given a good opportunity, and it was all about timing to kind of get me to where I'm at now. It's, it's, it's great to hear like in this career like any any career in the military it is difficult like this is not a sure cut anything like it's not like a you know we're not saying this is the the it's going to be an easy path and then we can see with, uh, with your words that hey at, at one moment i was trying to, i was quitting because I, I couldn't do this anymore and then what what is good is you have mentors that can actually put you back in track and, and that's good to hear. It's, it's amazing. Thank you for sharing. What about you, Rafael? Do you have any other experiences like that, similar? 
Uh, similar, I think uh, the mentors, the people behind you, the yeah. people around you uh, make make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I've had some falls throughout my career. Uh, we would have we would need a whole another episode for that. <laughs> so I'm not going to dive into it. Yeah. Uh, those that know me personally will know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been knocked down a few times, uh, you know, bounce around. But I had really strong mentors that told me, hey, yes. no one really cares about what happened or how you feel. Um, it's what you do after and it's how you get up and fight. So I felt like I was put under pressure quite, quite a lot. Um, but I had the right people in my corner. So overall, growing up in, in the Marine Corps, uh, in the enlisted ranks, uh, later becoming a staff uh, commission officer, mm -hmm. it opened my eyes to a lot of opportunities. Uh, but like most of my mentors said, as enlisted, we can influence uh, change as much as we are good at selling and making our, our suggestions to our officers. Um, making a change is something I've always been interested in, you know, helping others, mm -hmm. developing others, and then ensuring that people get the opportunities the same I got or if, if not better. Uh, I knew that was something I could influence and make a change as an officer more than I could as enlisted. So that drove my decision to go through the enlisted commissioning program. And here we are today. Yeah. So that was about to, to mention that and ask you that question. Can you expand on the decision and how uh, about the enlisted commission program? What led you through that and how was the process for those that are looking more information and if you can share like like the packet and, and what you have to do to actually get that. Well, oh, absolutely. Uh, for So there's multiple programs yeah. you can do to commission in the Marine Corps or even transition from the Marine Corps to the Navy uh, through medical programs. But for me specific, the options were uh, either MESEP, uh, ECP, or Warrant Officer. For, for myself, I, I chose the Enlisted Commissioning Program what that means is you have a degree, so you have a bachelor's already, and you apply uh, through the package form to headquarters Marine Corps to be approved to become a commission officer. Yeah. Uh, once approved, you go through a 10-week program uh, at Quantico. You go through officer uh, candidate school. And then once you pass that, you go through uh, the basic school, also in Quantico, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Uh, where after that you are in your MOS, uh, unless you already are on some sort of uh, legal uh, or aviation contract for those uh, who manage to, to have those up, up front. Uh, for myself, the package uh, was very intimidating at first. Mm. So you require ASVAP score, I believe minimum is 74. Okay. Uh, wow. And then other than that, you... Uh, your recommendations from previous commanders, uh, any O4s and above will look great on that. Um, high PFTs and CFTs, uh, what that means is having scores that set you apart from the rest. Like right? Marine Corps has standards, first, second, and third class is still a passing PFT, but at, now you're going against uh, that cream of the crop, mm -hmm. making sure you compete for a spot uh, at a headquarter Marine Corps level. So. Um, not saying it's bad to have anything less than that, but, um, it is very competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, honestly, uh, having good, uh, reviews. So for the Marine Corps sergeants and above get fit reps. Gotcha. So your evaluations matter, right? Um, your recommendations from your command matter. And then your chain of command all the way up to the general level are looking at your package and reviewing you, the wreck and stacking you yeah. against your peers also submitting for it. So having that good reputation, having a good head on your shoulders, uh, being a good uh, leader help because then your leaders who are recommending you have, have a voice, right? And they talk to that, that general level staff, mm -hmm. make sure that you get what you would deserve in that case. No, and, and great, great to hear that. And because I, we know those pack packages can be very challenging and sometimes even frustrating. Uh, because like obviously when you look like the bulk of the package is like maybe you, you think you will not do it but i'll say if you don't submit the package you will never know if you can make it or not so 
for those that are listening and thinking about this, like, go ahead, you know, and do it and submit it. Because sometimes we get the, the bad perception, like, hey, uh, I think we just stop ourselves on, on doing this. It's like, yeah, I, I don't want to do it because maybe they, they won't, you know, I'm not qualified, etc. One thing is be truthful to yourself, right? Because uh, you, you're saying, Rafael, there's, there's some PD scores, the ASBAPs, et cetera, the scores that you have to do. But, I mean, we encourage, I mean, if you have everything that it takes, go ahead and, and do it. You know what I mean? So I, I'll say it that way. I don't know if you, you can concur with that, Rafael. In my living. Absolutely. Um, I had to retake my ASBAP, which was very intimidating. Um, definitely put that off for a long, long time. I've had... Many people tell me, coworkers, like, hey, your package is done, but you just need to do this. And I was like, oh, hey, I'll keep, I'll, I'll do it next month. Yeah. Uh, it, it took one of my supervisors to look at me in the eyes and say, hey, tomorrow you're going to go take your ass back. <laughs> yeah. and, and I did, and I'm glad I did. I got, I'm glad I had my corner, and, and here we are, so it worked out. Nice. That's pretty, pretty nice. Madeline, with you, I have a question So about some challenges. So what has been the most challenging project or assignment uh, in your career and how you, do you handle it? If you have, you can share with us. I've been thinking about this question. Um, <laughs> it's a tough one after so many years trying to find one, uh, one thing that's been challenging. I'd say I had a challenge with myself and it's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a work assignment or project that I've been working on, but, you know, like I mentioned my first four years, was rough and then for a while I kind of let that affect me um, and kind of like write, write who I was as a marine and leader. Um, but I had the experience of my four years as my MOS and then I went into communication security. Um, I had other MOSs like spectrum management, you know, the frequencies and all of that led me to, to considering kind of what you just brought up. Like, okay, I, I, I think I'm qualified to submit for, you know, for warrant officer. Um, but I, I was very nervous. I did not think I was going to get uh, approved. I submitted the package uh, and I got approved for it. And so I think the biggest challenge was overcoming that okay. fear almost of, mm -hmm. am I going to get selected? What if I don't? Yep. Uh, and really molding myself to be a warrant officer. Yep. I got selected. I had in my head, which is not the right method. Yeah, yeah. Is submit, you have to be confident that you're going to get it. I got selected and it was that like, wow, now I have this big role to fill. So I think the biggest challenge really was personal development um, and accepting like, okay, there are some big changes I'm going to have to make. There's a lot of uh, educational things that I'm going to need to spend some time on professional development and just really a change of, of pace for me. Um, going warrant officer is a little bit different than going the regular commission mm -hmm. officer route, um, just as far as like roles and responsibilities. So I think that was a that was probably the biggest challenge I've faced uh, personally. You know, there's other projects and stuff that have been challenging within the roles of being an officer now, um, but that whole that whole story is is what I've overcome. It just took a lot of mentorship, mm -hmm. support from you know him. Yeah and just accepting the situation yeah so that, yeah that's uh family is the big support of it we're talking about mentors but at the end our family is our pillar our backbone right so um i'm not dual military so i have my my wife she's civilian but i've been in there in the in military in the army for 12 years and since i got into the army she has been the my backbone and she support all the decisions and etc and then when i when i feel down She's like, she's my, my psychologist, right? So I talk to her and then she just like, pump, pump me up back because like, I'm, we're doing this for the family. Rafael, mm -hmm. so now for you, can you describe a mission that particularly tested your skills uh, and manage those challenges if you have anything to share? Oh man, uh, I think that's a pretty vague question because <laughs> uh, challenges for, for, for us in the Marine Corps could be either mentally or physical mm -hmm. um i'd say a personal hurdle mm -hmm. that i had to to overcome okay that really really tested my resiliency and uh everything as a leader as both physical and mental was um honestly earning my uh my wings okay. as an air crewman okay so for those that know me also um i get seasick and i get airsick like it's nobody's mm -hmm. problem mm -hmm. but 
I had it in my head that I wanted to become an aviator okay. and starting out was very rough. <laughs> um, but same thing, man, I had a, I had a good support system. I had had the right mentors and most importantly, uh, the mindset of I was never going to quit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it was tough. It was tough at first getting used to it. Uh, it's like learning a new language. Yeah. Honestly, it was, uh, it was learning, how to become part of a crew for an aircraft and making sure that safety and, and everything was made properly. Right. So that we could come home alive. So that was, that was a big, that was a big challenge in my career. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we all had those challenges and, and again on the career. So my toughest uh, military school has been jump, jump, jump master so i'm an airborne paratrooper so jump master has been one of the toughest school and frustrating uh, and, and i understand that sometimes we challenge ourselves and the military likes to do that especially in military schools um madeline so can you speak a little bit like how to become a water officer in marine corps can you panel a, a little bit about that yeah so from my experience um i'm in the communications community so you have a couple options for the route for warrant officers so 0620 uh, space and propagation engineering officer uh, is an option that's, that's what i ended up going for um, there's also 0640 which is spectrum officer dealing with frequencies things like that so depending on what your focus is is what you submit for um, my, my MOS that I am now encompasses all of communications, mm -hmm. um, for say radios and satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have, you know, networking, we have data. So it depends on what, what area of communications you are. You basically submit a package. Um, and this process starts about a year out from when the, when you would go through a warrant officer basic course. Mm -hmm. So my, my timeline here was I hit eight years, which is the requirement. You have to have a minimum of eight years and you have to be um, a sergeant. So I was a staff sergeant at the time when I submitted. Uh, I put a package together. It's very similar from the commission mm -hmm. officer. Program. Uh, you have to have certain scores. You have to have, you know, there's certain requirements you have to meet. Submitted a package in February. The board convened in May and I got my results uh, middle of December okay. to check in the beginning of January that next year. Nice. So that's in wave tops of how it happens. You know, there are, I had to retake my ASVAB as well. Uh, very daunting. It's not as easy. <laughs> yeah, as of course. Yes, I, had the, I had the ASVAB book. I had the, the quizzes and it, it did. It took somebody being like, just go and take it. Like you just have to go and retake it. You can't put it off until you know, maybe one more quiz and I'll be ready. So right. that was a big challenge package. Um, we have submitted and and I was approved for uh, 0620. And that's the space and propagation engineer uh, officer. That's what you're yes. doing right now. And it, this is it, it, because when I read space and propagation, <laughs> it's like I, I think about Space Force. It's, uh, it's something related <laughs> with the Space Force. <laughs> I'm just like being curious with this now. Yeah. So I can explain a little bit, uh, space being, you know, things to do with satellites, mm -hmm. uh, satellite terminals, space domain, mm -hmm. and propagation being radio, line of sight equipment. Okay. So okay. I feel more about the transmissions okay. pieces. Okay. Okay. Um, and yeah, engineering officer basically is, we are building architecture. We're looking into equipment, uh, procurement, the future of, what communications is going to look like nice. in the Marine okay. Corps. Um, and so I'm in a communications company right now and I work with a team. We have, you know, same warrant officer in data systems, mm -hmm. uh, so programs on your computer, gotcha. um, let's say Teams, for example. Um, the they system. deal more with, like the system, the user okay. systems. And then we have networking and all of us combined, we create this, uh, this team and we plan and execute missions. It sounds like a lot of that data anal analytics uh, that you have to do. Um, I'm doing my master's right now. Uh, I'm doing my master here as we're speaking at VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University. I'm doing supply chain management. And part of, the, part of that, we have to do data analy uh, analytics and 
be honest with you, I don't like it. So uh, I'll, I'll stay with supply. Um, yeah, Rafael, can you speak about, and now I'm a logistics officer in the army, so I would like to hear about your experiences as a logistics officer in the Marine Corps. And, and then can you share about your role as a current operation assistant officer for those that are listening? Uh, yeah, so I'm the current operations assistant officer for the 3rd Marine Logistics Group here in Okinawa. Um, for a logistics officer, it's it's very, very wide spectrum. So we can do literally almost anything mm -hmm. in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, spe specific to my job, I plan for the sustainment of operations in troops within the Pacific um, area of operation. So... More specific, we have our subordinate units who are constantly, you know, out the door doing training and uh, sustaining the skills our, our Marines need and require to to maintain the force uh, readiness. So for for my my job in current operations, uh, we manage anything that they would need to make that mission that the boots on the ground actually perform that job. Yeah. Uh, I know that's kind of vague, uh, but it is uh, it is quite a lot uh, that that we handle. So it it, it would need more specific. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Um, and then can you can you both relate your your specific jobs maybe to the civilian sector? Like, hey, I'll, I if I decide to or if I retire tomorrow, I can find a job in X, Y, and Z, for example. Okay, can, can sure. Uh, my job specifically, it, it is so technical. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say it doesn't exactly transfer over, okay. uh, but it opens a lot of doors mm -hmm. uh, in the commercial side, civilian side. Mm -hmm. You know, communications is big. You look at gotcha. Elon Musk has created Starlink, right? Mm -hmm. So the DOD uses Starlink, but so do commercial companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need communications everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. you and I are going over a method of communication. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what focus you want to get into. Um, there's a lot of companies out here that take uh, prior military just mm -hmm. because we have the experience. We have certain trainings and schools that are um, that are in, you know, the companies interested in. Yep. Uh, but also, I think a big one that relates for my MLS is the security clearance that okay. you would get. Mm -hmm. That's a huge one for companies to look mm -hmm. at. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hard. I feel it's more difficult for me to be like, yep, I can go from no, security. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. I definitely have a, a, a lot of doors open, open yeah, yeah, because of my experience. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Rafael? I, I know the answer, but yeah. yeah I like that. <laughs> uh, well, for us, logistics, we can, work, we can work on anything. You mentioned you're, you're doing your master's in supply chain management. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the fields that, you know, logistics takes, takes a role in. Um, if for the, for the viewers, civilian sector, if you can think of it, if you can see it, if you can grab it, mm -hmm. or you think you need it, that involves logistics alone. So, uh, anything from the fields of, uh, you know, transportation to engineering, mm -hmm. uh, acquisition of materials or, uh, items that, that you may need for your job, uh, anything from housing or developmental projects. Uh, all of that involves logistics. Mm -hmm. so, again, a very, very, very vague answer, but uh, you can find uh, logistics in anything you, you could think of. So it, it would be more of a matter of where would I like to land yeah. after, after we're done with the Marine Corps? Yeah, I know. And, and again, this is more a question for the audience, uh, just in, co in case uh, there's some audience here like they're looking to get out of the, the military service, etc. So there's opportunities that I, I take all my knowledge from the army in my case, and I know um, I can transfer my skills and what I learned to the civilian sector in any time point, like whether I'm gonna do my 20 years in the, in the army, whether I'm gonna do four years. But the thing is like, these skills, you, you, can, you can use them for something else outside the military spectrum. And it's great because like, you have uh, logistics in one side with, with Rafael and then you have the whole space network communications with Madeline and Starlink and, and Elon Musk and all the stuff in the other hand. 
uh, which is which is amazing uh, to to hear about this. Okay, so let's let's go now. Let, let's talk about your family. So we talk about a lot, a lot of you know uh, per, uh, professional experiences. Let's uh, enlighten the audience on. Can you when you got uh, you cross your paths and then start to to grow up as a family and then the challenges that that lead to. I uh, I'll take this one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we met. Uh, uh, we were sergeants at the time um, when we met, and honestly, overall, if I say there's a balance between you know work, work, work and life, work life balance that I know a lot of people are asking, uh, kind of look for. If I say we had it, I'll be a liar. Um, the the thing we did know up front and we supported each other was that we both had goals within the Marine Corps that we wanted to achieve and we had visions. So I think equally we supported those those roles, those visions to make sure that we were both uh, individually happy, mm -hmm. right? And and we met our expectations while still putting an effort to to be there for one another and and you know be that pillar that that, that holds up the, the family um once we established a household we we thought it was going to be a lot easier but and honestly uh honestly made it a little harder you know <laughs> mm -hmm. uh we have like like we've already shared we've have very very technical jobs uh that require a lot of time and skill yeah. into uh what we do uh, a lot of planning a lot of hours that that take take up that and it's not as easy as hey uh, i'm gonna clock out and someone else has it um a lot of those skills are very unique and a lot of that takes time to develop so it's not something we can just put on somebody else's plate so again with the understanding piece and then knowing that it was you know it was a professional uh, need uh, and a development opportunity that we just uh continue to support each other uh, which led us here uh, today um, to where we are. Yeah. So, so, and you're in the point because, like, uh, there's no uh, real balance between you know um, professional and personal life. You sometimes you have to put more weight in one or the other. Uh, the key, the key of this is uh, your backbone, right? Your your understanding, like, hey, for example, Rafael, if you have, you're on a mission, like, you have to go deploy somewhere. Uh, then you have to speak uh, with Madeline and say like, hey, I'll, I'm, I'll ha I'm, I have to be gone for, I don't know, like, let's say nine months, for example. Um, and then you have to go and complete mission. And then while she's taking care of the uh, house of good, uh, uh, the, the house, same with Madeline, right? So if you have to deploy somewhere, then Rafael has to pick up uh, whatever, like, in bags. But now what about you, Madeline? How you, uh, how you can see this balance with the life and, and work? Yeah, it's funny. We were talking about this question and our immediate thought was like, we don't. Mm -hmm. And now not that we we can't manage both, but it is, it takes for our relationship, you know, it's it's not just here's our off time, here's our life, mm -hmm. here's work. So I think the moment that we were both able to accept um, that, that, that this is just how the relationship mm -hmm. is, right? It's not standard. It's not typical. It's not what you see in movies but once we accepted like this is what works for us and if we come home we need to vent about work great and if that's that's what we need to do um, I think that has helped both of us understand the support piece and work through those challenges um, there's been a lot of perks though I mean you have somebody who understands what you're going through even if you don't want to talk about it um, you kind of just understand like hey it's a rough day or hey I have to go um, I know I just got back from the field, but we have another operation. We're going to be in the field again. Mm -hmm. and we like, okay, what do you need from me? How can I help you? So I think the key for this is really individually being happy and, and self-sufficient in a way. Yeah. And we just get to enjoy life together. Um, not necessarily needing, uh, needing this balance to make things happen. So Life goes on, and we're just blessed to kind of, you know, be able to do it together. Yeah, and I, I can hear the jets over there right now. I think so, right? <laughs> Some jets happening. <laughs> I think so, maybe. Uh, but yeah, yeah, no, no, great to hear. And then, what about uh, um, 
being together in the same location, PCS into the same location, how, how that process works for you as a, as a dual military? Uh, so that was a sound of freedom. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> I, should, I heard something like in the background. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Sound yeah, free. I'm like, hey, America. <laughs> yeah, I'm right there. Um, so mo moving moving around in the Marine Corps uh, for us specifically has finally lined up uh, well. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we, we've had multiple assignments where we, we've been uh, separated for, for mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, in terms of training or, you know, deployments or whatever the case may be. Um, but then coming out here was by far, if I, if anything, the easiest transition, you know, uh, we, we knew we had orders together. We knew we were going to, you know, be here for, for the time, uh, that auto orders, um, are for. So it made it easier for planning and moving and everything else, um, But just like anything else, boxing up your your life, your house, and moving is it's not easy, you know. So uh, once we were here and established uh, the household, it was it was actually like very relaxing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we talk about your um, uh, personal life. So now let's talk about what's your future aspirations in the the Marine Corps. So anyone can actually start with that. Yeah. Okay. So right now I'm a chief warrant officer too. Um, I'm in a communications company. Mm -hmm. So what I'm aspiring to next, right? Like working in stages is uh, getting schools uh, complete, getting other training that's going to make me competitive. Mm -hmm. um, and the goal is to get promoted to chief warrant officer three and just move up along uh, the, the responsibilities uh, and the commands that I can go to. So Because I have a very technical MOS, yeah. this is my job, you know, until I retire, until I decide that I want to move on. Um, so as far as my options mm -hmm. uh, for continuing the Marine Corps, I have courses and that I can attend to um, different conferences and networking. And that's really my output or my, my goal is to get the networking and get everything I can. Um, But I don't have any other B billets that I am aspiring to. So it's just continuing mm -hmm. to be competitive yep. uh, and be engaged with the Marines as much as I can. Um, the further along I get in this in this career, the further removed I am from the Marines. You know, the the lower level, the ones who are actually out there doing putting in the work. So the goal is just to continue staying engaged and doing as much as I can within mm -hmm. that. What about you, Rafael? What are your aspirations in the Marines so far? Uh, so for me, short term uh, would be get some company XO, company commander time um, as a logistician. Mm -hmm. And then long term, I'd say I would love to one day say that I'm the first Puerto Rican born general in the Marine Corps. Okay. Uh, so I know that's going to take a lot of roads and a lot of uh, time to get there, but it is an aspiration and I'll, I'll make sure I keep my 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 hand on that pulse to make sure uh, we make the right moves and, and make it there. Yeah. So it's, that's, that's legit. Like becoming like the a general in the Marines and being born in the Puerto Rico in the island of Puerto Rico is going to be a huge because we, we don't see that many. <laughs> I don't think we have any. Um, maybe we do. Uh, yeah, we do. I don't want to be ignorant, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a great aspirations um, to be in the Marines and reach that hope hopefully you, you you go into the right path and, and 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 get that and both of you now so let's talk about a little bit of mentorship so we we spoke about mentorship uh throughout the the interview um do you know and this is answer right so the association of naval services officers right so can you speak about answer because i know Lieutenant Colonel Montalban, which is the president, he introduced uh, me, uh, one, uh, Chief Warrant Officer to Madeline Amodovar and First Lieutenant Rafael Amodovar. Can you speak about ANSO um, and then how that can shape your career? Um, yeah, we, we can hear that. So for, for the ANSO exposure I've had personally, uh, it's been from a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, some I consider family uh, growing up in the Marine Corps that uh, are part of the program that led me to to learning what ANSO was, uh, you know. So in terms of it, it's a lot of uh, networking mm -hmm. and opportunities that allow people with like goals and mindset to develop and grow uh, both personally and professionally. Uh, my experience with ANSO uh, is, uh, has been short. You know, I, I just became a member uh, recently. Mm -hmm. But knowing and seeing the faces behind ANSO and learning how many of my peers and people I'm actually close with uh, are part of ANSO has definitely, uh, you know, it kind of makes sense. Like, okay, I, I see why the program is where it's at. I, I can see the potential of it and, and why it's, it's going to work, mm -hmm. not just now, but in the future, uh, because the people behind it, uh, those of us involved in the program have a uh, very like uh we're very like-minded individuals mm -hmm. who look for the development opportunities who look for the success opportunities and look to make an impact greater than the, themselves so having that in your corner having somebody who thinks about not just the now but two three four steps ahead mm -hmm. and allows you to develop yourself into to a better person uh, i think the program has that uh and it has a lot of it yeah yeah definitely uh ansa can provide that uh it's a great platform for for networking and like i said people with like-minded uh because sometimes like we need those around you know ourselves because to continue growing because sometimes um, people that don't do not do well in the military is because, like, they lack of mentorship. And I think they offer ANSO is a great platform for those that are looking for mentorships. I know they have the symposiums coming up, like, uh, in the next couple months in the east side, in the, in the east side, um, eastern symposium. And then I know the west side is actually working. Um, I think the symposium is going to happen uh, in the next couple months here in Norfolk, uh, Virginia. And then it's going to be a great venue for those that are interested to actually know more about ANSO. They do, um, you know, they, they do scholarships, they do mentorships, they go one-on-one, -on -one, and, and it's a great platform for that. Now, uh, as we're wrapping up, um, I, know, I know that it's Sunday in, in Okinawa. Right now, I don't want to, you know, continue, you know, uh, a little bit of your time. So what advice would you offer to someone that considering a career in the military based on your own experiences? Um, I think if you're looking from, from the outside, you know, from being a civilian into joining the military, a lot of it that you need to first look into is uh, your grit. So knowing that things are not gonna be cookie cutter, they're gonna be challenging mm -hmm. and, and that there is a purpose behind it. Um, understanding that as an individual will definitely help you succeed um, and keeping that goal uh, in mind and keeping the why behind you're actually doing what you're doing. Um, the military will find ways to challenge you, to push your buttons, to put you in very, very uncomfortable situations. Mm -hmm. And if you are not seeking those uncomfortable situations within the military, you're also not growing as you should be growing to then further lead in combat and battle, which is what we provide as a force in readiness to to serve as a uh, for for our government and mm -hmm. for for the military, right? So, uh, anyone looking into becoming part of the military, whichever branch, it's going to find those challenges um, that will definitely make them better citizens and better members of the military later on in life. Yeah, so definitely this is a great advice uh, because like, again, we have talked about many challenges that that we will f uh, find ourselves in in, our, in this career, whether you're in the Army, Marines, Navy, Coast Guard, any, any, any sister branches, um, but it's how we overcome this uh, challenges and then at the end we are working for one goal, one goal only, right? So to defend our constitution of the United States, right? So that's why we raise our uh, right hand and then we're going to continue fighting that mission uh, until either you retire, right? Or you reach your your star, one star, two star general. Yeah, I mean, who, who knows, right? 
Uh, I know you're in, in the right path to do so, and you're like committed to it. So I'm rooting for you right now. So <laughs> I will see, like in, in along the road, and then you you'll become um, a feel great in that position. Any any other um, comments that you would like to share with the audience before we just uh, wrap it up, Rafael? I think uh, it's it's nice to keep in mind that you mentioned a little bit of it, right? Like there's there's multiple branches for a reason, and a lot of people try and and look for that uh, who's who's better than the other. Um, we all have our capability sets that we fulfill. And I think a lot of it is uh, the maturity to understand what we bring to the table. So keeping that in mind, uh, whether you are serving or whether you're looking to serve, uh, there's not a simple answer to w which one is gonna answer what, what you're looking for, right? So having that mindset will definitely take you further uh, and definitely seek, seek advice, seek, mentorship from those who have been in for a little bit uh, because it's going to help you uh, get much further than what you can even think about. Yeah, definitely. So, so we always have to look for outside our scopes because like we focus, we are something narrow minded minded. We look to our careers, but then we have to look for somebody that's outside that have been, has walked the, the path and then can get those insights from, from that. Those outlets are very like, crucial to our you know careers um and Absolutely. i think that's that's the key for us to be successful in in, in, in this um anything else i know like madeline is with the baby uh if not yeah, she has to get out. <laughs> yeah so i know she's there it's okay uh but if not anything else uh rafael no i appreciate the time uh appreciate you for having us and anso uh for this opportunity and we, we look forward to working with you and the team a lot more. So if, if you or anybody else needs anything, uh, make sure you reach out. Yeah. And, and again, thank you for having us like uh, open the, the doors of your house um, in, in Okinawa. Uh, and thank you for, for having this time to share a little bit of your experiences, because I know somebody that's listening will 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 take that. Uh, as a mentorship, we can impact to, to, to people that we don't even doesn't know, like by, you know, sharing a little bit of our uh, experiences. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to be wrapping up. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you, Madeline. <laughs> and I know she's with Thank the you. baby. Uh, I'm going to be uh, wrapping up uh, right now. So. Uh, thank you again uh, to Madeline and Rafael uh, for sharing their stories with us today uh, here at the ANSA podcast, uh, the Military Paths Unveiled. I'm Captain Manuel Calo, and I, it's been a pleasure hosting today's conversation. To our listeners, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, remember to check us in social media on YouTube on, and Facebook at ANSA Mail uh, and follow, us, follow the podcast on YouTube and Spotify as the ANSA Podcast. Join us next time as we continue to explore the unique paths uh, of those dedicating their lives to the service. Stay safe and keep marching forward. Until next time, goodbye.